All right, well, good morning here in Australia, here in country Victoria, in Gippsland. Uh, uh, here that there are, there are people from the Philippines, from Canada, from Queensland, New South Wales. Um, welcome everyone and welcome all those that will be watching this video on YouTube. Um, we're trying to catch up with the Spanish material by presenting um, an English version of where we are at at the um, YouTube channel for the Spanish speak for the English speakers. And uh, I want to thank Sarah and her group to for, for allowing me to share this morning some of the thoughts, some of the reflections that have been going on in the last 14 years in our household in uh through with my wife and my children and uh i'll give you a brief brief summary of who i am in the next um couple of minutes then how the evolution of my thinking um started and where it's at at the moment and then we just dig into the um the reasonings behind it the evidence behind it okay so my name is Oscar Sandy. I work as a clinical nutritionist in uh, Gippsland, Victoria. I also work as an operating room technician. I graduated. Uh, I've got a number of um, of degrees, but the one that is probably relevant for the lecture today is uh, I graduated in theology. I work as a pastor uh, and as a chaplain just for a short period of time. And I was involved in a um, very um, fundamentalist uh, group that um, awakened my understanding in the possibility that maybe we are wrong in our thinking. Um, that experience with me and my family uh, concluded uh, in 2009. That's when we moved to the state of Victoria in 2010. And my oldest son was uh, around 10, 10, 11, uh, around that time. And he had a very inquisitive mind. And because we had a very bad experience with the uh, fundamentalist group and a very fundamentalist approach to the scriptures, we want to make sure that our children uh, was were not exposed to that um, way of thinking and uh, they were not exposed to the disappointment that we went through. Initially, in my Christian experience, um, both my wife and I, we had a, a what I believe a very genuine uh, conversion experience. We crossed the Nalabo Plain from Sydney to Perth on a push bike. We had a very close encounters with death and as we arrived in Western Australia, in Perth, and we settled there, my wife had a, a dream. And through that dream, she got converted and she got baptized. And six months later, I got baptized also. And I'll share a little bit of her dream because that will become relevant later on. She had a dream in which she was in the middle of the ocean and around her, there was a multitude of people. And she was in, in a little dinghy, in a little boat, and our voice from heaven is telling her, uh, bring them into the boat. So my wife in the dream, she was afraid because obviously, you know, if she gets close to those people that are drowning around her, they will sink her down. So she was fearful to get closer to the people that were drowning. And um, ultimately, she decided to grab one person and bring that person inside her boat. As she did that, the, the little dinghy, the little boat grew. And then she put another one and the boat grew even better, even more. So she asked in that dream, how many do they have to put inside the boat? And the voice from heaven said, I want them all. I will save them all. And she looked around in three, 360 degree turn and it was just countless people all drowning in the ocean anyway we never made reference to that dream to ourselves until 2010 when we realized that maybe right from the beginning 
um, in our Christian experience, we were led to believe that God was going to restore the entire of humanity. Then I got converted six months later. I went to work in Western Australia, came back from work, got inside the, the, the train, and it was a drunk, a, 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 a person that was drunk, sleeping, uh, sitting down, half laying down in one of the seats in the inside the train. And when I saw him, I started crying. And despite the fact that I saw that man lost, I saw that man um, devastated by alcohol and, and everything else. Um, at that moment, I started crying because it was like, I felt that we served a God so mighty and but so loving and so good that he was going to even restore that man, that broken toy. He was going to be restored. And, uh, and that was the initial uh, spark that was quenched very quickly because obviously we knew nothing. We knew nothing about the Bible. We knew nothing about, you know, giving a Bible study or whatever. So then you join a church and in the church, they're going to educate you and you trust those people that are going to educate you because, because they've been there longer than you. So you, you, you come with, um, with a very soft heart, with a heart that has been touched by a loving God. And then you just take the advice of those that have been on that road supposedly longer than you. So um, we became uh, Bible-believing Christians and, and proving with text, you know, the truth of the gospel. And we we became, you know, a part of the remnant and part of the elite and part of those that follow the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus and so on. And as we did that, we became a groupie. We became uh, salvation basically just comes to us and for us. And if you want to be saved, you need to be part of us. And if you're not part of us, you're not going to be safe. Uh, uh, forward, uh, um, going forward a little bit, then I studied theology. I studied theology. I graduated um, uh, with uh, very good, um, very good marks in all subjects. And um, then I was going to do more than everyone else and because uh, I love the Lord more than everyone else. So I joined an even further fundamentalist group, you know, because uh, we were the chosen ones. We, were, we wanted to be part of the 144,000. And uh, we sold a house, the house of Western Australia, $300,000 house. And uh, we invested. We, we didn't want to have any attachments to this world because we're going to work for God. So we, we invested in the ministry. Needless to say that we lost it all <laughs> when we arrived here to Victoria after that bad experience and disappointment. Um, I actually had to borrow money from a friend in order to move my family here. Despite the fact that I got three university degrees, you know, I came here with no money and somebody actually had to pay the first few months of my rent. Um, so uh, he has actually taken me years to recover economically. Um, and, you know, from that uh, experience, I always say that religion has taken everything from me and God has given me everything. God has given me everything and religion has taken everything from me. So as we arrived in uh, in Victoria, as I said, my son was very inquisitive, and um, he will ask the hard questions. And the hard questions included, why would a God of love command Samuel to tell King Saul to kill everyone of the Amalekites, including the elderly, the lame, the pregnant women, and even the animals? That's a hard question. And I'll tell you what, for my son, it was not enough for, uh, for, for me and my wife to say to him, well, you know, the wisdom of the Lord is above human wisdom and we don't know, we just have to accept it and we accept it by faith. Because there's one thing clear, that loving your enemy is not the same thing as killing your enemy, no matter how, how you look at it. Loving your 
enemy is not the same as killing your enemy. Or let the little children come to me is not the same as grab the children of the Babylonians and smash them against the rock. Is not the same thing. So 2010, my wife and I, we developed a series called The Atheist God, in which God, God does not believe. And we took the people of our local congregations here to a point of the lake of fire. We took the people to all the way to the lake of fire. And on that journey up to the lake of, fi of fire, we presented the fact that we believe that God does not kill. And we, we studied the passages in the scripture that appeared, that said so, and we explained them in a different way. It's called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is, is the way in which you read the scriptures. And uh, we went to the point in which God does not kill. And that's what we presented to our children. And um, us... I was invited to present these to different places. I arrived in Madrid, the center church, one of the biggest churches in the center of Madrid, called Alensa. And I was going to present 10 presentations uh, of the final version of um, the atheist God, that basically God does not kill. I presented the 10 presentations and um, the pastor of the church, in presentation number seven, he invited me to his church, to, to his house, sorry, for lunch. And he said, I know where you're heading with this. Uh, I don't care if he's been recorded, um, but no matter what you say, if it's not biblical, he said to me on presentation number seven, if it's not biblical, I will stand up in the middle of the congregation, I'll cut you off. I said, no worries. I went all the way to, to 10. His wife came to me with tears in his in her eyes and gave me a hug and whispered in my ear and said, I can believe in this God. In this God, I can believe. Um, so, as, that, as, as I started to share that God does not kill and stopped at the lake of fire, the reason why I stopped at the lake of fire was because I, I felt confident to publicly share up to that point, despite the fact that behind doors in our home, um, I believe that God had already brought back to our attention the initial experience of our conversions and um, the, the conviction that God was going to restore humanity, humanity as a broken um, toy, humanity as the... Um, the feel of the potter. If you remember the feel of the potter that was purchased by the money um, of Jesus' betrayal by Judas, that feel of the potter, it was not a it was not a, a feel full of clay. It was a feel full of broken pottery. All broken vessels, broken there, were chucked into that feel on, on onto that field. The feel of the potter, and uh, you know, even things like that, even stories like that, then confirmed in our hearts. You know, it's like wow, it's like the first thing that Jesus' blood purchased was actually all the broken vessels he purchased by his money, by the money of the betrayal, by the thirty pieces of silver, the feel of the potter, all the, all the broken vessels, and we are the potter. We, sorry, he is the potter. We are the broken vessels. And he purchased them all. He purchased them all. Like if I just go to a bakery and I purchase the entire, the entire bakery, I purchase the entire bakery. If I come with a van and I just take with me just a few bags of bread and I go home just with a few pieces of bread, when I purchase the entire bakery, that's not a very good deal. Now... Let me just clarify something. To me, the issue is hermeneutics. You can prove with the Bible that when you die, you'll get burnt in hell. You can prove with the Bible that when you die, you go to sleep. You can prove with the Bible that when you die, you go straight to heaven. You can 
proof with the Bible that when you die, uh, you sleep a million years pass, then you get awakened, and then you're thrown into the fire, and then you get you will get consumed. You can prove it with the Bible. You can prove with the Bible that there's no hell, and you can prove with the Bible that God is going to save everyone. You can do all that with the same Bible. And the proof that what I'm saying is correct is the over 7,000 uh, registered Christian denominations all claiming to follow the Bible. If I give you instructions from Melbourne to Sydney, how to get to Sydney from Melbourne, and if you are on the Princess Highway uh, outside Melbourne, and I give you instructions to get to Sydney, and I give the same instructions to 100 people that know how to drive and they have enough petrol in the tank, 100% of the people will get there with instructions. If I give the Bible to 100 people, you end up with 2,000 denominations. If I give the book of Revelation to 100 people, you end up with 3,000 different interpretations. But if we follow in the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit that Jesus came to show us, uh, the revelation, the exact manifestation of God's character that is not found in the prophets, that is not found in the Old Testament either, because the book of Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that in various ways he told us about, about himself. But in these last days, he told us about himself in the exact manifestation of his glory in the figure of his Son. If we have read about Jesus, and if we have read how he behaved with people, we will see a person on the side of the road that is injured, and a hundred people will stop. Notice that. A hundred people reading the Bible will end up with many different denominations. But a hundred genuine people that have been touched by the spirit of kindness, love, redemption, forgiveness, a hundred people without a Bible will stop on the side of the road to help. At the end of the day, it was uh, exemplified with the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan was not a Bible-believing Christian, was not even a Bible-believing Jew. It is intentional that Jesus mentions a Samaritan. Because the Samaritan is the one that knows the doctrine. So, hermeneutics is the way we read it. So, what we actually started with my son and my daughters in 2010 was we were going to read the scriptures in a hermeneutic that depended on Christ as the filter. So, I'll give you a couple of examples first. So, if you remember Nehemiah, Nehemiah um, is recorded. Uh, is helping with the reconstruction of the wall in Jerusalem uh, after the exile and, and under the, the reign of the Middle Persians. And he's back and forth to, to the king of the Middle Persians and back into Jerusalem. When he comes back in chapter 13, he sees that the Jews are giving their sons and their daughters to get married to those locals, those that don't even speak the language of the Hebrews. And Nehemiah, a prophet of the Lord, uh, in, in, I think it's Nehemiah 13, around verse 23, 25 onwards, he says that he cursed them, he uh, grabs them by the beard, he throw them out, he commanded them to swear by God that they will not mix their daughters with their... Um, children of the locals in that area. Now, when you look at that scenario, you can, and you read it as a text-proof hermeneutics, you can excuse an elder of a church or a pastor in a church that is preaching a message such as this. And brothers and sisters, watch your daughters lest they end up in a relationship with someone that is not of us, that is not of a denomination. 
that doesn't speak our lingo, our language, that doesn't know our customs. And if any of them will come with their partners here to our church, oh, thank God that we are not in Old Testament times because it is written, and he's now he's going to quote scripture, that even as the prophet Nehemiah did, I will grab them by the beard, I will curse them, and um, I will command them to break that relationship. And he's quoting a scripture. And he's quoting a prophet. But if you filter it through Jesus, then you have a problem. Because Jesus says, do not curse. Nehemiah is cursing. Jesus says, no, not to the violence, put the other cheek. Nehemiah is grabbing them by the beer and punching them. Jesus says, don't swear by God, not by the altar. Nehemiah is demanding, commanding them to swear by God. And then all of a sudden, you realize that a story that has been used by a pastor to threaten the youngsters in the church, in their relationships, is actually showing by Jesus that Nehemiah acted wrong. I don't want to even go into um, the prophet Elijah. Iman Carmel mocking someone else's belief. Where is your God? Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe just gone for a nap. And then after the fire comes out from heaven, um, he commands the killing of 450 people. Now, place Jesus in the picture. Do you picture yourself, do you picture Jesus mocking and be trying to be funny in that way, diminishing someone else's religion? Yeah, call Allah. See what Allah does for you. Call Krishna. See what Krishna does for you. Maybe he's sleeping, maybe that's. Do you picture Jesus doing that? Showing off that way? Do you picture Jesus? The same Jesus that when a woman was caught in adultery, he found a way so that woman will not be astonished. Well, do you picture Jesus um, in front of a man that has been brought to him because he has been picking up sticks on the Sabbath? Do you picture the same Jesus commanding the people to stone that man? The same Jesus that actually told a man in Bethesda, carry your bed. Or the same one that makes sure that no one was stoning a, a woman caught in adultery. Do you picture Jesus commanding others to enter into the, the area of the Amalekites for something that the Amalekites supposedly did to Moses over 450 years before talking about holding grudges? and commanding them to kill the pregnant women? I personally don't picture Jesus that way. And I don't believe that God is a God that suffers from the bipolar disease. And loving your enemy is not the same as killing your enemy. It's not the same thing. That's what Pharaohs used to do. Pharaohs will have in one hand the rod of a shepherd. You'll see it. You see it in the images of pharaohs. They'll have the rod of a of a shepherd, and in the other hand, they had a whip, because they were shepherding the people and they were punishing the people at the same time. That was the ruler of Egypt, of the upper and lower Egypt. They were shepherds. They were shepherding the people, and at the same time, you know, punishing the people. I have asked many theologians over the last 14 years if, um, if I worship God, would I be safe? And they'll say yes. If I don't worship Him, would I be thrown in the lake of fire and burned forever or, or, or whatever, or be destroyed? I said, well, yes, that's also correct. I said, wouldn't Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, do the same thing? In Daniel chapter 3, if you worship him and his image and his ways of, of that he demanded worship, you will be favored 
by Nebuchadnezzar. He will give you riches. He will give you glory. He will. You will be um, called by a, a king's name. You'll be uplifted. Oh, but if you do not worship the same way that he demands, that he commands you to do, rather than happiness and glory and and a life of of goodness and and living in paradise, you'll be thrown in the lake of fire or in his furnace. And for the last 14 years, uh, I realized that um, Christianity, or what is called Christianity today, is worshipping a God that is not too far off from Nebuchadnezzar. So, the idea is that we do not disagree with people in the way of their conclusions. We disagree with people in the way in which our starting points are. I start reading the Bible filtering through Christ and through the spirit of Christ that was shown through the parables, through through his um through his speech, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So I filter the entire Bible that way. That's why I'm confident in my understanding to say that I do not believe that it was God that commanded Moses to tell the people to stone the men that grab sticks on the Sabbath. I actually see a lot of the things as the God in human image rather than humans in God's image. When we're looking at the narrative, we see a God that gets angry a God that, that holds grudges, a, whole, a God that is looking for revenge, a God that repents, a God that changes his mind, a God that... So, it's not God making man to his image, is man trying to explain the difficulties of the hardships of life and making God unto their image. So Christ comes and he tells a parable in which those that don't work in the vineyard get the same reward as those that have been working the entire day, a denarius for all of them. We call as humans that it is not justice so when i say to people that i believe in the restoration of all humanity some that are practicing the christianity as it is understood today will say well that is not just don't forget that god is love but is also just but when they're talking about justice they're not talking about god's justice they're talking about human justice because for them Someone like Hitler cannot be safe because that will not be just. But they're talking about human justice. They're really talking about that person has not worked in the vineyard. He should not get the same denarius. So the prodigal son has been out and about and he cannot be re reinstated as a son. That is not Fair is not justice. So when they're talking about God is also just, what they're really, really talking about is the creation of God and to their image that they have in their mind and they're projecting it. When you start looking at God at, as a bigger, bigger and brighter than any human restrictions can create, it's just overwhelming. It's just overwhelming. I'm just going to tell you something very quickly since I had touched on the uh, story of the prodigal son. Um, think about how much the prodigal son took with him when he went out and about, you know, and left the father. And people say, well, he, he took the inheritance. He's, he's part of inheritance. Then I asked the question, uh, well, how much did he take? He said, well, well he took half because there was only two brothers. And I said, well, remember that Jesus is talking to Jewish people. And in Jewish uh, tradition, also taken from the Old Testament, their oldest son will take double. 
double the inheritance goes to the oldest son. So if you have two people and you are going to separate the inheritance um, double to one and double to, to the oldest and the rest to the youngest, how much is the oldest getting? Well, you actually separate inheritance in three parts. Two parts are going to the oldest and one part is going to the youngest because the oldest gets double. So think about it because the youngest took one third of the inheritance. And that is in numerology in the scriptures, uh, as, as the scriptures use numerology, which actually comes from uh, a lot from the, their time in, in Babylon and Middle Persia, uh, the usage of numerology um, inserted in the text and so on. In, numerolog or in numerology, one third is associated with evil. One third is associated with, and we see it in the book of Revelation, you know, the, the, the fallen star that takes one third of the stars of heaven. How, how much did the prodigal took? One third of the inheritance. And it's interesting because I don't even have a problem if Satan, if, if Satan is a, a character to be redeemed, that God will redeem him and restore him. Not just restore him, but even give him a new name, not the name Satan being the enemy, but Lucifer, the light bearer. Because when the prodigal son comes back, he is re reinstated as his position, same as before, as a son. And the ultimate prodigal in the story, in the biblical story, the ultimate prodigal is Satan, the one that took one third. Of God's inheritance in the of the angels and and so on, as as the story uh, unfolds to us, as, as the narrative in the story tell, uh, tells us that way. So um, the ultimate the ultimate uh, prodigal will be him. So so then I'm thinking, okay, well, if uh, if he's the ultimate prodigal, and the only one that gets upset is not the father, is the oldest son. Then the, I work as a, in the health industry, so then I have to diagnose a syndrome. And I have diagnosed the syndrome, the all brother syndrome. The gnashing of teeth, the all brother uh, syndrome, which is the same syndrome that, get, and that affects those um, that get paid the same amount, though they work all through the day and they get upset. Because those that didn't work get paid the same amount. They suffer from the old brother syndrome. Uh, it's the same syndrome that Jonah, the prophet Jonah, had. Had the, old brother, uh, the older brother syndrome. His happiness is not only based on the fact that um, he is safe as being part of Israel. His happiness depends on the fact that Nineveh gets burned. If Nineveh does not get burned, his happiness is not complete. The oldest brother's syndrome, he, his happiness depends on the fact that he is safe, that he is in paradise, that he is with the Father, that he has his inheritance, together with the fact that his brother perishes. If his brother uh, is safe too, because he's affected by this disease, by this illness, it's that gnashing of teeth, stays out in the darkness outside, while everybody inside is just waiting for him to come in. The one that is affected by the all, all, all the brother's syndrome is uh, the scribes and the Pharisees that Jesus said to them, you will see the prostitutes and the tax collectors and, and all the, uh, the rejects of society walking into the kingdom first. You will see them first. You will see them coming in first. In fact, in the book of Romans chapter 11, it says that the Gentiles will come first. Then the entire Israel will come after. So all will be complete.
That's in Romans 11, verse 24, 25. You read the entire chapter from, in fact, if you read from chapter 9 to chapter 11, you realized, you know, that the last ones that they enter are those that thought they were the first in entering. Because those that believe that they are the first for this, for, for the, and, and despite those that are the rejects, um, they end up entering, praise God, last. Um, because they have a sickness that is a more deep sickness than what a drug addict or prostitute has. There's the sickness of who is the greatest. Uh, is the sickness of believing that they are the remnant, they are the chosen ones. You know how many denominations are the remnant church? Uh, registered about 7,500. They're all the remnant. Uh, otherwise, they will move to, to on, only to one. They all believe. You ask an uh, Adventist, a uh, Jehovah Witness, you ask a uh, uh, um, uh, devout, devout uh, Catholic, a uh, Pentecostal, you ask. Who, who is the remnant church? They all tell. They all will tell you. They all suffer from the same syndrome. If you're not part of us, uh, you can't make it. And if you make it, they will not get upset with you. The older brother is not upset with the younger brother because the younger brother is celebrating the house. He's coming home. The older brother is upset with the father so that is a very sickening syndrome you know they are upset with god if the restoration of all humanity is true they are they will be upset with god so you can't be upset with god and expect to be in god's paradise i said to people this uh especially um those that, that that believe in um the way christianity has been uh, portrayed today um i say look if you are if you are right i'm done <laughs> but i'm but i'm good with that i'm at peace i am i am at peace with that but if i am right the good news for you is that you also be safe so I say to them, you will be safe if you are right, and you will be safe if I am right, as opposed to myself. Because if you are right, I am doomed. But I'll tell you what, I have already made up my mind. I want to be with the ones that Jesus would be, if that was the case. Because Jesus mingled with sinners. So if I'm going to be lost, I want to mingle with sinners, as Jesus did. Uh, ultimately, friends, I want to tell you uh, something very clear. If, in order to be safe, I need to enjoy eternity with the same being that commanded the killing of children, the killing of the lame, the killing of innocent people, if I need to be in paradise with a being in order to be safe and live forever, I need to be with a being that um, that commanded a group of people to enter into a land that had citizens living in it and command them to destroy them one by one to conquer that land. If I need to actually um, be believe or, or be comfortable in that paradise with a being that anoints a very uh, savage ruler called Nebuchadnezzar to discipline a rebellious nation called Israel and then anoint another ruler, Cyrus, to punish Babylon because Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, which in turn was anointed years before to Punish Jerusalem. Like, oh, come on, this is just getting too crazy. If I need to believe in that in order to live forever, I'll tell you what, I'm happy on the burning. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. 
I don't need a parapsycho God to offer me paradise. I want a loving God. I want the God that Jesus came to show us. That's the God that I want. And if I am wrong, if God is not that and is not going to restore the entire humanity, and it is in fact a God that you know will have in one hand the the rod of a shepherd and in the other hand a whip. If that is in in fact the God that uh, that is the real one, if not not a human creation, but a, but the real one. If that is the real one, I'm I'm happy in the fire. I'm happy to being consumed. No, I got no no problems with that. Um, because I walked away from Phariseeism in 2010, and I'm not going back to Phariseeism in in eternity. Okay, so let's go to just quickly. I just. I just tell you something, something very quickly, and then we open the forum if you, if you will. Okay. So now we've got plenty of scriptures, as I said, that as a scriptures as a proof text, we can actually prove that God will restore humanity. Okay, and they are the the precise scriptures that those that don't believe that God will restore humanity, you will, will alter, will not quote in their Bible studies and things like that. Okay. So there's plenty of scriptures like that. Uh, but just bear in mind one thing. When we study, for instance, the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is a word picture book. Um, it is very interesting how some people believe that the fire is literal. And I said, why do you believe the fire is literal? Because it says very clearly here that they will be thrown in the lake of fire. Prepare for the devil and so on. And it is very um it's very, very clear that um because it's written and they give you the proof. So just very quickly, I just touch on that and then we open the forum uh in, in a minute. When you go to Revelation 14, you have a message of what I call the message of the seven angels. Now, some of you might have heard that as the message of the three angels. And that's because you only read half of the chapter. When you read the entire chapter, there's actually seven angels. Because what is known to be the first angel, he says, and I saw another angel. And they say, well, that's the first angel. So hold on a second. If I saw another angel, that means that it has to be one at least prior to that. So the first angel in reality is the second angel. Then he goes, you know, another angel and another angel. And basically, they're giving a warning. And in that warning, it says, if you not worship, if you not worship, the, if you don't worship God, but you worship the beast, you'll be thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, that's the warning. So if you don't do this, you'll be thrown to the lake of fire. If you look at the first of those listed angels, so the threat is this: the 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 threatening command is this: if you worship the beast, you will be thrown into the fire. So some people will say, well, see, it's clear. But then as you read the chapter, continue to read the chapter, you discover there's another three angels. That's why I call it the seven angels, which com which is confirmed at the beginning of chapter 15 when it says, then the seven angels. Okay. So the second part of Revela Revelation 14 tells you actually what happens. And what happens is this. First, the first three angels, they th the, the, the threatening um, picture is this. You worship the beast, you'll be thrown into the fire. Then what happens is, then the angel came and got the shekel, went to the earth and harvest the harvest because the earth was, was ready. And he put the grapes into the wine presser and pressed the wine presser. Of those that, you know, those that worship the beast pretty much. And you go, hold on a second. You've been threatening me with throwing me into the fire. But now when when the rubber hits the road, you're throwing me into the wine presser. Why are you throwing me into the wine presser when you were your threat was to throw me into the fire? So then I ask the question to those that choose to be literal in, in certain parts and not literal in others, especially in the book of Revelation. 
Um, and so, so, so the fire is literal. So, yeah, 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 the fire is literal. But the what about the wine press? No, the wine press is an image. It's an illustration. So, oh, okay. But the fire is literal. So, yeah. What about in Malachi when he says, when he mixes the fire, uh, and he also says, and it will be like the soap of the launderer. You know, you, you, the launderer that gets soap and it gets rid of the dirt. So, well, the, the launderer is a, is a, is a, it's an image. And so, okay. But the fire, oh, no, the fire is literal. Okay. So the fire is not a word image, it's literal. Yeah. And, but the, um, but the launderer with the soap that washes away, that is a word image. Yes. What about the outer darkness? Well, that is symbolic. But the fire, or well, the fire is literal. So the outer darkness is symbolic because obviously you can't be in the fire and be in outer darkness, right? Because that's the first thing that you you turn on when you are in the darkness. You lit up a fire. So you can't be in outer darkness and be in the fire at the same time. So then the outer darkness has to be symbolic and the literal bead is the fire. So what about the gnashing of teeth? What about the oven? What about the the uh, the the uh, scattered over the eagles? Um, what about all the they all were images? So what is the only thing that is literal? Or, uh, the only thing that is literal is the fire. Isn't that interesting? That the Bible is trying to sort of give us different word images, and some people they just choose the fire to be literal. So then I went and said, okay, well let's go to go literal then. Let's go to grab the fire as literal. So, when you look at Revelation 14, you see the following. Let's see, see if I got if I got a picture here. You, you look at Revelation 14, written in the first century, for first century audience. And he says the following. In Revelation 14, um, verse 8. He says, and another angel follows, saying, Babylon, Babylon is fallen, the great city, because she has made the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worship the beast and his image, he receives his mark on his forehead and on his hand. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Um, which is poured out for strength into the cup of his indignation and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of the torment ascend forever and ever, and they have not rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark in his name. It's very interesting because when you look at the details, uh, you're actually looking at alchemy. Alchemy is a practice in which um, an ancient practice of refining metals. A lake of fire, the word lake is simle, simle. And it is a word that means the, the larger or smaller, the, the um, container or the, the, um, yeah, the container, the, the big big bucket where metals are melted. And um, the word tormented actually is um, basamismos, which comes from the rock basalt or basalt, which is also in alchemist. When you read every single detail, every time that the lake of fire is mentioned, in the way it's mentioned, it contains these elements. Uh, it contains the res um, the bucket, the, the the big bucket for um, refining of metals. It contains basalt. It contains smoke coming up. Uh, there's also mention in the Book of Revelation of refine as gold um, and refine as silver, etc. So the way alchemists worked was this. They'll throw everything inside. They will throw absolutely every metal inside in order to extract the gold and the silver. And what they will do, um, they will add something that to this day there has not been one theologian 
that believes in um, in eternal torment or or um, hell for the sinner and things like that has not been able to answer me when I ask them why brainstorm and they say well, beg your pardon I said yeah why when God comes to kill us why does he need fire and brainstorm why the brainstorm why is this why is the brainstorm necessary if fire not enough why does he need brainstorm and it's like to kill you killed you to double kill you why the brainstorm and the interesting thing is that because they don't know that the entire thing of the lake of fire is that word picture of an alchemist because they don't know that um, because they've been influenced without they necessarily recognizing it uh, or sometimes being ignorant to, to the fact that a lot of the interpretations of the lake of fire does come from the Middle Ages, um, not from the first century alchemist language. So they don't realize that brimstone or sulfur, which is what it is, is also another word for the, another element that is used in, in the refining of metals. So imagine a lake of fire, uh, a limme of fire, which is the word. And now you've got the fire and then that thing is becoming very, very hot. And now you put the metals, you throw everything that has some dirt on it, some, some, um, um, some scrap, some, some rubbish in it. You're, you put everything inside. So now the whole thing is melting. Now you have the fire and everything is melting. You throw everything in the lake of fire, in the limne of fire. Now everything is melted. Now how are you going to extract the, the gold? Or how are you going to extract the silver? Well, you need something. And yes, you guessed it, it's sulfur. So you, just, you can't just do it with, with the fire. You need the sulfur or brimstone, which is the same thing. So as you throw fire and brimstone, the brimstone actually, or the sulfur, uh, bounds to the particles of iron. So you end up with um, iron sulfate, and it comes up to the surface. Nothing is hidden anymore. It comes up to the surface. So the, um, the sulfur will bound with the copper. It will go up and it will be copper sulfate and it comes up to the surface and the alchemist on top will just take all the scum all that rubbish that comes up because he's not interested in the copper he's not interested in the rubbish he's not uh interested in the manganese in the magnesium in the calcium and all that the calcium will 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 um the melted calcium will will um bound uh the nickel will bound and it will go and you will have sulfur nickel or nickel sulfur whatever it is and it will come up to the surface so the alchemist will just take off take off take off all the rubbish until eventually you just have a melted uh soup of two metals gold and silver but they're now melted and as they are melted you need to split them out. You need gold and silver. And how do you do that? If you remember, even Jesus quoted this in Mark chapter 9. He says that every sacrifice has to be seasoned with salt. Guess what? When you put salt, okay, the silver bounds to the chloride and you got silver chloride and it comes up to the surface. And now you harvest the silver. And as you harvest the silver, because you need, besides the sulfur, you put the salt, you harvest the silver. Now you end up just with the salt, with the, with the, gold, with the gold. Now what you, did, do, you need to do with the gold is you need to make sure that there's no impurities in it. So you keep on putting sulfur, and if a smoke comes up, the smoke coming up, that means that it's burning and bringing up the impurities still. And then you need the basalt, which is being translated as torment, which is the testing, which should have been a better word, the testing 
against a black surface. So the basalt is a rock that is black. So the alchemist will get the gold and will put a little touch of gold upon that black surface for contrast. And that's why the word basamismo is should have actually been translated rather than torment, you know, for the testing or for the um, viewing of contrast. And that's how the alchemist will realize that you have a full gold uh, refined because it's been contrasted by the black. Okay, so um, so if they want to go literal with the fire, there you go. Of you, <laughs> you of you go. There you have it. Okay, so it is alchemist. It's word pictures because the same word pictures that you'll get out of the wine press. You notice that in the lake of fire, as an alchemist, you put everything in that has some kind of impurity. All the impurities have been taken out. Then you end up with something at the end. Not with nothing, but with something, gold and silver. But guess what? When the other word picture tells me that I'll be thrown into the wine press and be pressed down, you still get something. You get all the pulp on one side, and then you have the wine on the other. It's a weird picture. So you still get the wine. And guess what? Remember the first parable or sign that the uh, Gospel of John gives us? You brought the best wine at the end. <laughs> you know? Because he says some... Um, you know, it talks about you know the the uh, the harvest. You know, the harvest is coming. Will be will be will be with the redeemed. Will be in the in the barn, in the granary. Yeah, okay. Well, if you if you part of the grain that will be in the granary, out of the grain you make bread. My question is, where's the where's the wine? Where's the wine? Well, the wine is in the wine press, and the last wine comes at the end. I thought many times having children myself, how does God wipe away the tears of the eye, from the eyes of a mother whose child is not there in eternity? If he's not allowed to wipe off the memory, because if he was allowed to wipe off the memory, you know, it would have been much easier for everybody if he just kill Satan right from the start and wipe up the memory, right? So if he's not allowed to wipe up the memory of the mother uh, in regards to her son, how can a mother stop crying for a son that is forever lost? And the only answer is the restoration of humanity. When that son is back, and his back restored, not broken, not under the addiction of drug addictions, but restore. That's the only way. The amount of times that I have been contacted over the last uh, six, seven years when I went public with this message on YouTube in Spanish, the amount of emails that I've got from parents whose children have committed suicide, thanking me for sharing that message. Can you imagine a father or mother that has to bury the son? And, and you know, religion will tell us, you know, that that son has to be buried outside of this denominational cemetery, you know, because it's been out of suicide, you know, and that son will be lost. You know, I'll close with this um, and we'll go into the, into the chit chat. In Psalm 22, there's an amazing thing here. If you go to Psalm 22, and um, you go, let's say, let's say, um, verse 20, I'm just going to go verse 24. I could maybe quote, I can go earlier than that, but let's, let's go verse 24 in Psalm, Psalm 22. It says, for he has not despised nor had heard the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him, but when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. 
The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember. All, I mean, it's all the ends of the world. Shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust. I'll tell you what, the, the, you know, the, many Christians choke on that verse. They don't know what to do with it all. They need to sort of do some kind of jiggling around because all means all and they, they don't like it. All those who go down to the dust, and I get those parents to read this verse. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who could not keep himself alive. And when the parents that have children that committed suicide read, even those that cannot keep himself alive, they start crying because they realize that that's my son. He could not keep himself alive. That's my son. Are you telling me that my son has a yes? That's exactly what I'm telling you. Um, some, some. Uh, I've got a, a lady in Mexico. Uh, she, her name is Dora, like Dora the Explorer, and she she says that she has one thousand five hundred daughters. She has a jail ministry, and she lives in a very rough area in Chiap Chiapas, Mexico. A child becomes a drug addict at the age of six. At the age of six, a drug addict, because the uh, drug lords give them drugs to hook them up, and then they become mules for the drug lords. So they're little six years old now. In order to get the drug, uh, they do all this uh, courier work for the drug lords. By the age of ten, they all have their own gun. By the age of fourteen, a lot of them they either kill themselves or kill others. So there was this mother that walked into a congregation where Dora every so often goes, and uh, when she is not visiting the jail. And this mother um, met Dora, and Dora catch up with her a little bit. But because Dora is busy in jail, in and out, uh, visiting and so on, um, so she wasn't going every single weekend to this congregation. And and when she returned back, she asked, uh, "Where's that that young woman that that came? Um, where is she?" And she, "Oh, uh, her son committed suicide. He killed himself. He was only seventeen or something like that." So Dora just grabbed the two, uh, the ch the elder and the pastor of that church, and said, "We need to go and visit that lady. We need to give her hope." She says, she, 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 she shares the messages from our YouTube channel in jail, and uh, so she grabs the pastor and she grabs the elder, and drives them to this woman's house. And it was so funny to hear her talking. Um, because she has a very rough language, uh, very colorful, if you know what I mean, very colorful Spanish, uh, you know, a little bit like Pablo Escobar <laughs> type of thing. And she goes and says, um, and Oscar, I was there looking at those two men, and I tried to be respectful, you know, trying to honor leadership. You know, they were the elder, and they were he was the elder, and he was the pastor. I was, you know, and I was just waiting. I was waiting. Itchy feet and itchy tongue, you know. I was waiting for those two men to give hope to this woman whose son was a drug addict at the age of six, talking about free will, and um, and kill, and you know, being be working for the drug lords to survive because if you're not part of them you will not get to the to the age of 10 you will die earlier than that that's a total different world out there and i was waiting oscar i was waiting for those people to say something to this mother and those she says and those pendejos like <laughs> those like she started just calling their own names they they were sitting there not saying anything 
What kind of good news they got? They got no good news for a mother that lost their son. What kind of gospel is that? There's no gospel. There's no good news. They had nothing. And you know why they couldn't say anything? Because they don't have it. They don't have any good news to share. They can tell the world that the hour of the judgment has come, but they, they, can't, they can't give good news to a mother living in the poorest part of Mexico um, that has lost her son. She said, I waited as long as I could wait, Oscar. And forgive me, God, but I just step, step in. Forget about leadership, hierarchy or whatever. I step in, I gave her my hug. I grabbed her shoulders, I shook her up, I looked at her face and I said, you will see your son restore again, not under the influence of drugs or drug lords or crime or guns or, ev or poverty or anything like that. God has not given you a son to take your son forever. God has not given you your son to make you suffer for him here and then suffer for him there. That is not God's plan. So, what, um, what I mentioned to Sarah before is in order for, for my editing program to work better, we will do the, we will stop the recording now.